Hi. Bonjour. Hi. Donc, je me présente à Ambroise Adonlegi. So I introduce myself. I'm Ambroise Adonlegi. J'ai rencontré le ministère au Togo. I met the ministry in Togo. Avec Pastor Luigi. With Pastor Luigi. Et ensuite, j'ai travaillé les dix dernières années avec Pastor Michel à, à, à Paris. And the last ten years, I've been working with Pastor Texier in Paris. Et je faisais partie euh, de ses assistants. And I'm one of his assistants. Et on a vécu de, de bonnes choses dans, à, à Paris. And we have lived good things in Paris. Et là, Dieu a ouvert les portes pour qu'on soit avec vous pendant une année. And God has opened the doors for us to be here for one year with you. Donc, je suis venu avec ma femme qui est là. So I'm here with my wife who's here. Et, et, mes, et mes enfants. And my children. Et en tout cas, on veut vous dire aussi merci parce que c'est quelque part grâce à vous si on est là. And we also want to say thank you because it's thanks to you that we are here. Non seulement grâce à vos prières. Not only thanks to your prayers. Mais on est aussi venu par le, le, la bourse des pasteurs. But we also came through the fundings for pastors. Uh, le, the pastor scholarship. The pastor scholarship. Donc merci. So thank you. Et merci à tous les pasteurs, à Pastor Chaleur, à tous ces pasteurs. And thank, thanks to Pastor Chaleur and all the pastors. De nous nourrir comme ils le font. To honor us in the way they de do. De nous nourrir comme ils le font. Or to feed us in the way they do. Parce qu'on est, yeah, de nous nourrir. Parce qu'on est nourri. Because we are fed. Et on, on apprécie chaque moment qu'on passe ici avec vous. And we appreciate every moment we spend here with you. Donc il m'a été demandé de, de partager une pensée avec vous ce matin. So I was asked to share one thought with you this morning. Je dis merci à Dieu pour cette grâce. And we say thank you to God for this grace. Donc est-ce que vous voulez tourner avec moi dans trois passages des Écritures? If you want to turn with me in three passages of the Scriptures. Je vais laisser Sandrine lire en anglais. Yeah, I'll read in English. Dans le Psaume 119, verset 130. In Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. Et un, un autre passage, Ephésiens 1, verset 18 à 19. And Ephesians 1, verse 18 and 19. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Et le dernier passage, Marc, chapitre 6, verset 34. And the last passage, Mark 6, 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Père éternel, nous te bénissons. Eternal Father, we bless you. Nos yeux sont sur toi ce matin. Our eyes are on you this morning. Et merci de continuer de toucher nos cœurs. Thank you to continue to touch our hearts. Bénis cette portion. Bless this portion. Amen. Amen. Dans le passage de Marc, chapitre 6, In the passage of Mark, chapter 6, j'aime bien dans, quand les Écritures décrivent les émotions de notre Seigneur. I love it when the scriptures describe the emotions of our Lord. Et dans ce passage, il nous est dit que Jésus était ému de compassion quand il a vu la foule. And in this passage, it says that Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the crowd. Et il a comparé cette foule à des brebis qui n'avaient pas de berger. And he compared this crowd to sheep without a shepherd. Devant cette foule qui n'avait pas de berger. In front of us people who didn't have a shepherd. Jésus était ému de compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion. Et la première chose qui m'a touché en lisant ce passage, And the first thing that touched me when I read this passage, c'est de voir que nous adorons un Dieu qui n'est pas indifférent à ce que nous vivons. We are worshiping a God who's not indifferent to what we are. Dieu living. n'est pas indifférent face à aux situations que nous traversons. God is not indifferent concerning the situations we're going through. Dieu n'est pas indifférent lorsqu'on rencontre des difficultés. God is not indifferent when we're going through difficulties. Il, il n'est pas indifférent. He's not indifferent. Il n'est pas enfin, il n'est pas indifférent. He is not indifferent. Vous savez, dans, dans Luc chapitre 19. In Luke chapter 19. La Bible nous dit que lorsqu'il avançait vers Jérusalem. It says that when he went towards Jerusalem. Il a juste commencé à pleurer. He started to cry. Parce qu'il a réalisé que ce peuple n'a pas reçu euh, sa personne. 
because he realized that these people did not receive his person. Oh, si toi seulement en ce jour qui t'est donné. And in that day it was given. Si tu pouvais recevoir ce que Dieu veut te donner. If you could Jésus. receive what God was giving you. Donc Jésus n'était pas indifférent. So Jesus was not indifferent. Mais il n'est pas aussi différent lorsqu'on on, on, on traverse des moments de joie. And when we go through times of joy. Vous savez, euh, dans Luc chapitre 10. In Luke chapter 10. Il nous est dit que Jésus était très, Jésus très saillé de joie. It says that Jesus was full of joy. Et il dit. And he says, Je te loue, Père, I praise you, Father, de ce que tu as caché ces choses aux sages et aux intelligents. That you have hidden those things from the wise and the intelligent. Mais que tu les as révélés aux enfants. But you revealed it to children. Je te loue parce que les enfants l'ont reçu. I praise you because children have received it. Notre Dieu n'est pas indifférent lorsqu'on reçoit sa pensée. Our God is not indifferent when we are receiving His thought. He's moved with joy. Dans Jérémie chapitre 13, In verset 17, 13, 17, il dit si vous n'écoutez pas, he says, if you're not listening, je me cacherai I will hide, et je pleurerai and I will weep à cause de votre orgueil. Because of your pride. Lorsque nous sommes orgueilleux, when we are proud, notre Dieu n'est pas indifférent. Our God is not indifferent. Il n'est pas en colère, he's not angry, mais il pleure. But he, he cries. Quel Dieu nous avons What a God we have, qui n'est pas indifférent face à ce que nous vivons. Who is not indifferent concerning what we're going through. Et dans ce passage de Marc chapitre 6, and in this passage of Mark chapter 6, où cette foule était misérable, où cette foule était misérable. This crowd was miserable. Vous savez, notre Seigneur n'était pas indifférent, comme je viens de le dire. And as I said, our Lord was not indifferent. Et quelle est la solution qu'il leur propose? And what is the solution he's, pro he's giving them? La Bible dit, il se mit à leur enseigner beaucoup de choses. The Bible says he started to teach them many things. C'est-à-dire que la solution de Dieu à notre misère, which means that the solution of God for our misery, c'est sa parole. It's his word. C'est la précieuse parole de Dieu. It's a precious word of la Jesus. La solution de Dieu à notre misère, the solution of God for our misery, c'est sa parole. It's his word. Il se mit à leur enseigner beaucoup de choses. He started to teach them many things. Diel Moody, Diel Moody a dit quelque chose que je trouvais intéressant. Said something I found interesting. Il dit, je priais pour avoir la foi. He said, I was praying to have faith. Pensant qu'un jour, thinking that one day, la foi viendrait me frapper comme un éclair. Faith would come and hit me like, a, like lightning. Mais la foi ne semblait pas venir. But faith didn't seem to come. Et un jour, and one day, j'ai lu Romains 10, verset 17. I, re I read Romans 10, 17. Où il est dit, la foi vient de ce qu'on entend. Where it says, faith comes by hearing. Et ce qu'on entend vient de la parole de Christ. And hearing by the word of God. Il dit, j'avais fermé la Bible. He said, I had closed the Bible. Et prié pour avoir la foi. And was praying to have faith. J'ai alors ouvert ma Bible. Then I opened my Bible. Et j'ai commencé à l'étudier. And I started to study Et it. la foi n'a pas cessé de grandir. And faith did not stop growing. Je dis, le problème dans nos vies souvent. I often say the problem in our lives. Le problème dans ce monde. The problem in this world. C'est qu'on a fermé le livre. Is that we closed the book. On ferme le livre et on pense qu'en fermant le livre, on ira, on ira mieux. And we close the book and we think by closing the book we will do better. Combien de fois dans ma vie je me trouve avec le livre fermé? How many times in my life I find myself with a book closed? Alors que la solution de Dieu face à ma misère. While the solution, God's solution face to oh, my misery. Oh, c'est que ce livre soit toujours ouvert dans mon cœur. Is that this book will always be open in our hearts. Que ce livre soit hearts. toujours ouvert dans mon cœur. That this book will always be open in our hearts. Parce que c'est là sa solution. Hearts, Et je vais terminer. That's his solution. Et je vais terminer en disant, and I want to finish by saying, dans le psaume 119 qu'on a lu ensemble, in the psalm 119 that we read together, nous a dit l'entrée de sa parole illumine les yeux. We said that the entrance of his word enlightened our eyes. Et dans le deuxième passage d'Éphésiens, and in the second passage in Ephesians, Paul prie pour que nos yeux soient illuminés, Paul prayed for our eyes to be enlightened, afin que nous sachions. So that we may know que nous avons une, es une espérance, that we have a hope, que nous avons un héritage, that we have an inheritance, que nous avons un Dieu capable. That we have a God who is able. Et je vais terminer en disant qu'il y a trois choses lorsque le livre reste ouvert dans nos cœurs. And I want to say there are three things when our book, the book stays open in our hearts. La première hearts. chose c'est l'espérance. The first thing is hope. Vous savez ce matin. This morning. Peut-être on va quitter ces salles sans trouver de réelles solutions à nos problèmes. Maybe we're gonna leave this without finding real Mais answers to our problems. Mais il y a une chose qui est certaine. The one thing is sure. Je peux quitter cette salle. 
I can leave this room avec un cœur rempli d'espérance. Parce que lorsque le livre est ouvert, when the book is open, nos cœurs sont remplis d'espérance. Dans ce livre ouvert, when this book is open, je vois Jésus marcher des kilomètres pour aller rencontrer une femme à, à Samarie. I can see Jesus walking kilometers to, to meet one woman in et, Samaria. Et la Bible dit il fallait que Jésus passe par la Samarie. And the Bible says, Jesus had to go through Samaria. C'est-à-dire que pour Dieu, c'est une nécessité de communier avec nous. C'est ce que je lis dans ce livre. Which means that for God, it's a necessity to commune with us, and that's what I read mon cœur in this book, and it fills my heart with hope. Lorsque Bartimée criait, when Bartimaeus was screaming, la foule le faisait taire. The crowd was making him Mais Jésus s'est arrêté. But Jesus stopped. Et dit Bartimée, and he said, Bartimaeus, come. Jésus s'est arrêté pour Bartimée. Jesus stopped for Bartimaeus. Et ça me remplit d'espérance. Peut-être que mon problème de couple ne sera pas résolu aujourd'hui. My, Mais je vais sortir de cette salle avec un cœur rempli d'espérance. Parce que nous avons un Dieu qui veut remplir nos cœurs d'espérance. Osée chapitre 2, verset 17. Hosea, chapter 2, verse 17. Dieu a donné la vallée d'accord comme une porte d'espérance. God gave a valley of Achor as a door of hope. Comme pasteur John l'a prêché au, au cours. Like pastor preached in the, in the class. Pourquoi la vallée d'Achor peut devenir pour nous une porte d'espérance? Why does the valley of Achor become the door of hope? Parce que dans la vallée d'Achor. Because in that valley. Dieu a traité le péché d'Achan. God dealt with the sin of Adam. Et le peuple peut croire de nouveau à la victoire. And the, the People can believe again for victory. Dans ce livre, qu'est-ce que je vois lorsque ce livre est ouvert What do I see in this book when the book is open? Que Dieu a traité mes péchés. That God dealt with my sin. Le, le mont de Calvaire a pris soin de tout. That the Mount of Calvary took care of everything. Alors je peux avancer. So I can go forward. Avec un cœur rempli d'espérance. With a heart full of hope. La deuxième chose que je vois lorsqu'on ce livre est ouvert dans nos cœurs. The second thing I see when this book is open in my heart. C'est que nous avons un héritage. Is that we have an inheritance. Nous avons un héritage. We have an inheritance. Dans le psaume 73. In Psalm 73. Azaf était jaloux, était jaloux à envoyant le, le bien-être des méchants. Azaf was envious when he saw the, the well-being of the evil people. Et il dit au verset 16. And he says in verse 16. La difficulté fut grande à mes yeux. The difficulty was big in my eyes. Jusqu'à ce que j'eusse entré dans le sanctuaire de Dieu. Until I came into the sanctuary of God. Et que je considère la fin du méchant. And I beheld the end of the wicked. Qu'est-ce que cela veut dire? What does it mean? Que lorsque Azaf est rentré dans le sanctuaire de Dieu. When Azaf came into the sanctuary of God. Dieu a ouvert ses yeux sur ce qu'il lui a donné. God opened his eyes to what he had given him. Dieu a ouvert ses yeux sur son héritage. God opened his eyes to his inheritance. Ce n'est pas le monde qui va me donner mon héritage. It's not the world that's going to give me my inheritance. Ce n'est pas ma chair qui va m'enseigner mon héritage. It's not going to be my flesh who's going to teach me my inheritance. C'est lorsque le livre est toujours ouvert dans mon cœur. It's when the book is always open in my heart. Vous savez, je me suis dit, wow, comme c'est merveilleux de, de, de savoir que notre Dieu I was thinking how marvelous it is that our God ne nous a pas juste donné ce qu'il a didn't just give us what he has. C'est-à-dire sa doctrine ou sa pensée. His doctrine and his, his thoughts. Mais il nous a aussi donné ce qu'il est. He also gave us who he is. Sa vie. His life. Et ce matin nous avons sa vie. And this morning we have his life. Et la dernière chose que nous trouvons lorsque le livre est ouvert. And the last thing we find when the book is open. L'infinie grandeur de sa puissance. The infinite uh, greatness of his power. Nous avons un Dieu qui est capable. Sorry. Nous avons un Dieu qui est capable. We have a God who is able. Nous avons un Dieu qui est capable. We have a God who is able. Que le livre soit toujours ouvert dans nos cœurs. May the book be always open in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Wow, isn't that good? Thank you, Lord. Wow. Awesome. The French, the speaking French, it's such a beautiful language, isn't it? I, I wished I, I so much wish I paid attention when I was in school. <laughs> really. I, I, I think I sat there in the ninth grade and thought to myself, oh, when am I ever going to need this? Oh, if we only knew. Amen. What a great word. All right, Father, thank you so much for that message. Uh, we have heard enough already to sustain us. 
throughout this day and throughout the week to come. Uh, please, Lord, may we find ourselves always in our hearts with that book open. Um, and thank you this morning that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. May we never become dull of hearing, but always give you our ear, Lord, so that the Spirit of God can speak to us. Thank you again for that wonderful portion. In Jesus' name, bless now these thoughts to follow in Christ's name. Amen. Um, you know, most of us, <clears throat> I, I don't know what it is, and I think, well, it has to, be, to do with the fact that we are of a particular race, the human race, um, have a tendency to, you know, catalog our, our burdens, chronicle our problems, and identify, you know, with great precision our enemies in life. And, I, you know, it's just something about, maybe you're the kind of person, I've very rarely met a few of these people, but, you know, maybe you get up in the morning and, you know, maybe the first thought is faith-filled, optimistic, amazing, God-glorifying. That's not me. You know, I might get up and, you know, kind of gather as I did this morning, and I thought to myself, must be raining out, you know? And then think, you know, my second thought is, gutters are filled with leaves, and somebody's going to have to clean them. I hope my wife is feeling good today. <laughs> no, I, would ne I wouldn't do that. <laughs> my grandson. Um, um, but, you know, and then, you know, you maybe you get out to the car, and you just, you first, oh, just, there's no gas in the car. I've got to get gas. And, you know, you just, I don't know what it is. It's just our natures to kind of have that kind of an attitude. Uh, you know, rather than getting up in the morning and saying, oh, boy, you know, rain. Oh, we need it. You know, we need it. First thought that comes to your mind is all those people that work at, you know, basement systems and have that, you know, that, that their theme song is Our God Reigns, and you know, they, you know, oh, bless them, Lord, they need it, bring lots of it, you know, and then you get into the car, and you just, you look at your gas tanks, almost on empty, but you think, oh, I have gas, I have enough to get to the station, praise your holy name, uh, sure, we all do that, don't we? Um, but, but think about it. If, if we are those that, that, that kind of alphabetize all of our problems and, you know, catalog all of the troubles and the burdens, and that becomes our habit. Imagine if that becomes the habit of our lives, a practice um, of our lives. What, what begins to happen? We can begin to lose sight of our blessings. And we have a lot of blessings, don't we? We come, we become blind to our to all of the benefits, and I think of Psalm one hundred three, verse two. The psalmist said, "You know, my soul, whatever you do, don't forget all the benefits that God has given us." And, and there are so many. We, it's a good thing to learn how to number our benefits, isn't it? Instead of cataloging our burdens and alphabetizing our problems, how about cataloging all those benefits? We've got many of them. And you know that, it's interesting because that word, the, the Greek word, beni, it comes, it means something good. We've got a lot of good things from God, right? We've got a lot, we, we get all the benefits. The benefits are amazing. And the benefits come from a benefactor, okay? Uh, the word beni, again, good, and the word factor there, it's where we get our English word factory. You know what God runs? God runs a good factory. He's always producing good things. And those good things are the benefits. And then with the benefits and the benefactor, you need a beneficiary. That's us. Amen. Aren't we the beneficiaries? Aren't we the ones who receive all those good things from God? In James chapter 1, verse 17, we're reminded that every good and perfect, it comes from above, from the Father of lights. Every good. You know, everything good that we have, believe me, it, it has come from God. You know, it's not the results of our hard work, trust me. You know, it's not that we are entitled to anything or that we deserve anything. And I, I, maybe I shared that with you, but when visiting my daughter in Nantucket one night, she, we, we were down by the water, and she says, you've got to come down and see these amazing yachts. 
You've never seen anything like them. And she was right. Some of them bigger than our homes. And some of them one, two, three floors. And you can tell some of these yachts, they had a full staff. There's like several people working in there. And she brought me down to one of them at night. And of course, they're all lit up from the bottom and you can see everything. Just absolutely glorious. But I, I, was, I was shocked when I, I looked at one of these, you know, one of these huge, on the back of it, because each one of them has a name. They each have a name. And on this one, the biggest one in the harbor, you know what it said? Deserved. <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know? In other words, you could just see the owner, maybe he's standing on top of the deck saying, I deserve this. I worked hard. I'm entitled to this. You know? I think I'd rather have a little rowboat that says grace on the back of it. You know what I mean? I'm getting to the other side. I don't know where your yacht's going to bring you, but I'm going to the other side. I've got heaven. I've got Christ. I've got forgiveness. I've got eternal life. I've got the body of Christ. I've got a lot of benefits. And I'm going to enjoy them here in my little rowboat. But you know what? I'm beginning to really think that there is a, a, a cure for a grumpy spirit. It's called gratitude. It really is, you know? And it's a good thing to practice. You know, I, I like it, you know, sometimes I go into that, you know, the coffee shop and I get my coffee and, and you got to go through one door and then you go through another door. And sometimes people will hold that door open for you and, and, and I, you just say, thank you. And then they go to the second door and then they hold it again. And I think to myself, does the previous thank you cover for this one? <laughs> Was that earlier Thanksgiving good enough to cover this? Do I have to say it again? But I say it again. You know, they kind of look at you like, you already said that. And it's like, no, I just want to practice. Because having an attitude like that, an attitude of Thanksgiving, an attitude of really gratitude is what really does something for our souls. I think the word, just think about it, the word alone lifts our spirits, doesn't it? Just thanks. Just saying it has a way to almost initi initiate change in our, in our attitudes. You know, of course, I'm kind of setting myself up for after the service today, everybody. everybody th thanks for the message. Thanks. For, yeah, 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 yeah. Don't feel obligated. If you hated it, tell me. And I'll thank God for you anyhow. But really, uh, saying thank you is a kind of a way of, of, of crossing the tracks, so to speak, from, from not having to having a lot by the grace of God. There's just something about it. It's like a proclamation. When you say thank you, and you have that as an attitude, a frame of reference in your soul, it's like a proclamation that says, in effect, listen, I'm not disadvantaged, I'm not disabled, I'm not victimized, I'm not forgotten, I'm not ignored, I'm blessed. I am so blessed. Look at us here this morning. We are so blessed just to be able to be here. Amen? I mean, you know, we could be, you know, who knows? We could be in prison. We could be out in the lake catching nothing, right? We, we could be, you know, watching our favorite football team lose again. Uh, I mean, they, you know, I, I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just, you're, whatever team that is, I don't know who that is. But in Scripture, notice with the Bible, everywhere in Scripture you find the word, give thanks, give thanks. Gratitude appears over, I think it's over 100 times it seems to show up in the Bible. And every time it does, it's never, you know, a good idea or a suggestion or a recommendation. You know what it is? It's a command. How about that? It's a command. Just like, you know, love one another. We recognize that. We understand that. Well, so it is. You know, give thanks. And boy, why do we hear about it so often? Why is it recorded for us some 100 times in the scriptures and that we find it over and over again? Maybe, just maybe, and I want to suggest this this morning, that maybe because ingratitude might have a lot to do with the original sin, the first sin that we read about in the Bible, in the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, in the garden. Think about it. Adam and Eve are in that garden. In that garden, God made that. That was the Garden of Eden. God created it. You can just imagine how glorious, how majestic, how beautiful it must have been. I mean, all the benefits in that garden, come on. Probably hundreds and thousands and, and who knows, you know, just waterfalls and glorious colors and wow. And it, and, and it was safe. It was safe. No terrorists, right? 
No, no possibility of, a, of an economic collapse. You know, Adam didn't wake up in the morning, look at Eve and say, how do you think the market's going to do today? <laughs> you know, I mean, just absolutely. So safe that they, they wore no clothing in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. Nothing to hide and nobody to hide from. That's amazing. They're kind of like one with creation in a good sense, one with each other, and they are one with God. In fact, God himself loved that garden so much that in the cool of the day, the Bible says, he would kind of walk through it. It's almost like God himself was enjoying that glorious place until Satan slithered into the garden, right? And he raised the question about what? The forbidden tree, the forbidden fruit. And isn't it interesting that they could eat from every tree in the garden? And yet, what did he focus on? The one, the one tree that they could not touch. The one tree that they were forbidden to go near. That's what he focused on. And he even said in, in the third chapter, the fifth verse, he says, you know, if you eat this, you know, you'll, you'll end up being like God. And just like that, Eden was not enough. But it was enough. It had everything. More than enough. But all of a sudden, it was not enough. Because God said you can have everything. Every seed-bearing plant and fruit in the garden, it is yours in Genesis 1.29. And then the serpent's suggestion. It opened the door. What did it open the door to? Discontent. Maybe we, maybe we aren't, maybe we don't really have everything. Maybe we don't have everything what we want. Maybe there's something more that we need. And that's the door that he opens, the door of discontent. And then we know the rest of the story. And then, you know, just for speculation's sake, we wonder, well, what, what if gratitude, because this, this discontent was the beginning of ingratitude. And what if, we, we just wonder this, I wonder this, what if thanksgiving, what if gratitude won the day? I mean, we can only speculate because that, that simply wasn't the case. But what if, our, what if our first parents said, you know, the devil comes and says, hey, you need to take of this tree. You, need to, you can have, you can, I know all that stuff, that's all well and good, but you can have this tree. What if our first parents responded to him and said, are you kidding me? Have you lost your little serpent's mind? I mean, come on. Have you seen this place? Have you looked around? And imagine they just kind of, grab the snake and take him on a little tour of Eden. This is absolutely glorious. You know, I mean, you know maybe the devil's going, yeah, geez, you're right. It really is awesome, you know. What was I thinking? Tempting you in the first place. Well, we know what he was doing. But just imagine if they had been content with all that God had so graciously given them. Imagine if their hearts were just so filled with thanksgiving that they just kind of, you know, passed off his temptation and passed off his suggestion and said, listen, not even interested, not going to go there. We have so much here to be thankful for. Well, we know that it couldn't be different. We know that it's not different. The question for you and I is, not what if, you know, what if Adam and Eve chose gratitude, but what about us? What if we choose gratitude? How about our world? Would our world be different if we choose gratitude? If that's our attitude in life? If we develop this, you know, the, the practice and the habit of saying, Lord, thank you. I recognize my benefits. I recognize all my gifts. I recognize the nature of the blessings that you poured into my life. How many? All of them, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says. We've been given all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, and we haven't even begun to really appropriate all of those blessings. Maybe we have some of them, but we've got a lot left to possess. Amen? Well, our lives can be different. Our world can be different. You know, the serpent always comes and suggests and, and brings his questions, and he says, listen, don't you, don't you want more? And God keeps telling us, you don't need to focus on wanting more, but just focus on what you have. Focus on what I've given you. And that's not to suggest here this morning that we can't strive to be better and, and add things to our lives. There's nothing wrong with that. And maybe if you're driving a car around and it's breaking, out, you know, breaking down and, and you say, I need a better. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's something wrong with a heart that lacks gratitude. It just seems to open the door to ingratitude. And then we think of what the scripture says, in everything, give thanks. Everything. 
When you, how about this? In trouble, yes, give thanks. In the hospital, yes, give thanks. You know? Uh, it, it, you know it, you're in debt. How about that one? Yes, I know. Hard to imagine, but you could say, thank you, Lord. In a fix, give thanks. In a mess, in darkness, in distress, in all, you know, even more than that, just what? Give thanks. Because there's something delivering about gratitude. There's something that touches the heart of God. It, it just seems to move God and, and, and capture his attention and say, look at that soul. They, they refuse to be occupied with what they don't have, and they're always so filled with gratitude for what they do have. Everything give thanks. I, I kind of marveled as I did a little study and began to see how often Jesus himself gave thanks to God. I mean, he was feeding 5,000 people. And, and they, they, you know, it was getting late in the day, and they were hungry. And the disciples, well, you know the disciples, they stepped up and they said, Lord, get rid of them. Send them home. You know? But Jesus says, no, today we're going to feed them. And then he, he proceeds by the grace of God to feed 5,000 people. And just as he was ready to feed them, you know what he did? He gave thanks for what they had. How little it was that they had, but he thanked God for it. And the result was 5,000 people were fed. And I'll bet you that just put a smile on his face. He thanked God when the disciples returned from their first missionary journey in Luke chapter 10, verse 21. And he thanked God for the success of that missionary journey. He thanked his father for hearing him when he called Lazarus forth from the tomb in John's gospel, chapter 11. I mean, everybody's heart was filled with sadness, sorrow, even unbelief. But Jesus said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. And then he called forth Lazarus out of the womb. He thanked God for the fact that he was about to sacrifice his own life on a cross for others in Matthew 26, verse 27, as he shared that last communion supper with his disciples. He thanked God, not just for the elements that night, he thanked God that he was given the privilege to die and to lay down his life so that people could have eternal life. He thanked God. That's the practice. That's the habit of Jesus everywhere in the gospel. I can't imagine that when he touched the eyes of blind Bartimaeus and for the first time, blind Bartimaeus opened his eyes and maybe Jesus thought to himself, wow, this guy is going to see his first sunset for the first time in his life. I'll bet you he said, oh, thank you, Father. And every time he healed someone, thank you, Father. It was the habit of Jesus. It can be our habit. You contrast that habit of giving thanks to God with the, you know, the habit sometimes of the children of Israel in the Old Testament at Numbers chapter 21 in particular. We're familiar with that story. And it's kind of ironic because, you know, the grumbling started and the complaining started with the children of Israel. And then immediately they began to speak against God and against Moses, and why did you bring us out of Egypt anyhow uh, to die here in the desert? And, and by the way, by the way, they said, we hate, we hate this manna. You know, even to this day, we can't even figure it out because that's what the word manna means. What is it? We've been eating what is it now for months, and we still don't know what it is, and we don't like it. And we want the menu changed now. And isn't it interesting that when this grumbling and complaining started, when this ingratitude started, what came into the camp? Fiery serpents. Isn't that interesting that the devil always seems to be right on the doorstep when our hearts lack gratitude and we open the door to ingratitude? Someone sent an email from India, the conference, and they said that they were up late one night and, and Pastor Arpi was preaching and, and while he was preaching, and she said that a lot of people in the audience, it was so late that many of them had fallen asleep. And he said that, she said that this, all of a sudden they saw this, this, what they thought was a big stick. And it wasn't a stick, it was a snake. A seven foot snake showed up at the conference. It was kind of the devil, like, oh, they're having such a good time. I've got to send somebody represent me. You know? And Pat, they said that Pastor Arpy says he, he made the sign of a cross and he said, You, you stay right where you are, you don't move. And he didn't, and 15 minutes later, he and other brothers came back in with sticks and beat it to death. But that snake, they said, did not move once, almost as if the authority of God was present. And they said, you, oh, just stay right there. We want to get a camera. Not really. Sticks, we're going to kill you. <laughs> and they did. But you know, when the children of Israel first came out of Egypt, what filled their hearts? Thanksgiving. 
Uh, when they were singing, they were dancing, they were celebrating. When they first got manna, what was in their hearts? Thanksgiving. And then before you know it, it was not enough. The hot desert began to evaporate their faith. And all of a sudden, you know, it wasn't enough to escape slavery in Egypt. It wasn't enough to be delivered for, by, the, you know, by the hand of God from their enemies. It wasn't enough to be the recipients of God's supernatural provision. They turned sour. They opened that door. Ingratitude crept in. It found a way to disturb their souls and to trouble them so that they began to cry out against Moses and cry out against God. And, you know, sooner or later, that ingratitude makes you raise your fist and its object is the very face of God. Look at what you've done. Why did you bother doing this? The serpent shows up. This time in the camp he brought his friends. Ingratitude just seems to open the door to the devil. That's why, that's why I want to practice it. That's why every day of my life I want to just develop an attitude a disposition of, of thanksgiving. I want to practice it all the time. I want to go through both doors at Wawa and say thank you, thank you. You know, and I want to hold both doors and not necessarily to have somebody say thank you to me, but just because I want to do it. And if they don't say thanks, that's OK. I'm not going to let the door, you know, fall on them and their hot coffee spill all over the place. And then look at them and say, that's what you get for not saying thanks. <laughs> See, just like that, the devil shows up. No, no. But think about this with the children of Israel in that camp. What was the cure for ingratitude? They took the, the brazen serpent. They finally called upon God and they said to Moses, please ask the Lord for forgiveness. You know, we're sorry. And, and what was the answer? The answer was put the brazen serpent upon the pole and lift it up because that's our answer. Amen. To ingratitude, look up. Always look up. Lift up your eyes. Look at what God has done. Keep the book open. Don't close the book. Personally, individually keep the book open. Keep the book open when we gather together for Bible studies, church services, or Bible college classes. In, in, in the quietness of our lives, keep the book. Why? Because when you keep the book open, you know you keep your eyes up. You're looking up. You're not downcast. You're looking at what God has done. You're considering the work that he accomplished on the cross. Look up, you have a savior this morning who has triumphed over sin, triumphed over death. You have a victory that no one can take from you. And as discouraged as we may sometimes feel in our lives, no one can take away the fact that it is finished, that we have a savior. He's won a decisive victory for us and nothing can take it away. That's what God promises us. I think... God's solution to any challenge that we have in life is simply this, a grateful spirit. I think it just changes everything. It's almost like a grateful spirit just kind of purges our souls from self-pity. You know, it's like a dialysis, if you will. And that's what it does. It, it purges the soul, just like, you know, our kidneys work in such a way to remove all of that, all of the toxins in our bodies. Well, I think that a, a grateful spirit works in our souls, and it delivers us from self-pity. It delivers us from an attitude of ingratitude, and it, and it delivers us so that we can have a spirit of thanksgiving toward God. I read this story about one pastor who was going to see one of the congregation members in his church, a very, an older gentleman, and he, this guy was always optimistic, always praising God, always had that, that wonderful attitude of thanksgiving, and always he would sit up in the front of the church and lifting his hands to, to worship and singing with all of his heart, you know, from the first word to the last verse of the song, just awesome. And the pastor says, I went to see him in his home, and he had been away for some time. Heart disease, again, had just kind of sucked the strength right out of his body. He, he, couldn't, he had a hard time sleeping, and, and it was real, very difficult. His energy was gone, and the pastor went to his home, and he sat down beside him. He grabbed him by the hand, and he said, Jack, how you doing? And he says, I hear you're not doing well. And, and he says, oh, no, 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 pastor. He says, never better. He says, but I, but I heard you're not, you're not getting any sleep. He says, no, 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 I can't. He says, but I can sure pray. I've been praying all the time. He just kind of tilted his head and twinkled in his eyes. He says, I, I just, I spend all my time now, because I can't sleep, just, just talking to Jesus. I thank him for how much he loves me. I tell him how much I love him. I tell him how good he is. He said to the pastor, he says, Pastor, these are good times for me. He says, I've never been talking to Jesus as much as I have now. Wow. 
I think two days later, he went home to be with the Lord. But he's the victor in life, isn't he? Why? Because imagine, I, 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 you know, none of us know. <laughs> we don't know. God is so good, he doesn't tell us how we're going to leave this life. But wouldn't you want to leave this life with a grateful heart? Don't you want to leave and exit this world with an attitude of praise? Somebody says, well, how? yeah, that would be awesome. How, how, do you, how do you die with gratitude? You live with it. You live with it. And then you can die with it in your heart, on your lips. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, he said that ingratitude was the hallmark of a life opposed to God. The unbelieving world is characterized by ingratitude. It says in the scriptures that when they, when they knew there was a God, neither were they thankful. And then a whole host of calamities took place. Their eyes were darkened. You know, they, they exchanged the truth of God and began to worship creatures instead of the creator. And just a whole host of terrible calamities began to unfold upon the human race. Why? It all began with an unthankful heart. It's that important. In closing, I read a cute story about a lawyer who won a case for his client, and the two men gathered together for lunch, celebrated. At the end of the meal, the client, he handed the lawyer a fine wallet made of this Moroccan leather. He said, please accept this as a token of my appreciation. The lawyer resists. He says, no. He says, I can't settle for a wallet. My fee is $500. The client looked at the lawyer and he shrugged. He says, whatever you say. He opened the wallet and he took out two $500 bills, put one back in the wallet and handed it to the lawyer. <laughs> he could have had them both. Don't be too quick in your assessment of God's gifts. There might be something hiding in your trouble that you can be thankful for. There might be something hiding in your sickness that you can be thankful for. There might be something hiding in your disease that you can be thankful for. There might be hiding in something in, in, in your loss that you can be thankful for. Just don't be too quick to make an assessment. Say, no, 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 no. no Lord, that's not what I wanted. God says, but it is what you need. And if you receive it, you'll have a grateful heart. In the end, whatever God sends, just be sure to thank him. For in it, you could receive so much, much more than you could ever have asked for or imagined. Because he is the God who stands ready to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. Doesn't he? Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, as we close our service this morning, we just come before you with a heart filled with thanksgiving. And even if it's difficult for us to express that, would you help us? Help us, teach us what it means to be grateful people, thankful people, people that appreciate everything. Because in everything, we are told to give thanks. Sometimes that's going to challenge us to be sure. But as we heard this morning, if we can look at life through an open book, even by faith, we'll be able to say, thank you, Lord. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ in a personal way as your Savior, let him come into your heart. Let him cleanse you of your sin. Because if you ever wanted to really thank God, you will never be able to thank him enough for the fact that he sent his son to die in your place. Open your heart. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Live. Cleanse me of my sin. Save me. Just so that I'll have the privilege of being able to thank you for that great gift. Say, Jesus, come into my heart and live. If you said that prayer, would you just... Put your hand up and put it right back down. We want to pray for you and give you a, a package, a gift today from us here at the Greater Grace World Outreach. Anyone here today, put your hand up 
and put it right back down. Father, thank you. Thank you for our services this morning at 9 o'clock and what we've heard today during this service. We are your thankful people. And we cannot thank you enough. And we are, as we leave the chapel today and throughout the course of this day, help us, remind us, make sure that we don't forget all of the benefits that are ours. Not looking at what we don't have. Not listening to the suggestion of the serpent and opening the door of discontent, which leads to ingratitude. No, Lord, may our hearts always be thankful for who you are, what you've done, and what you keep giving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, would you stand, please? All right now, the service tonight is 6.30. We'll have a great service tonight. Uh, also Wednesday, 7.30.